Welcome to WeTV, where faith intersects with life. This is Craig Finstead, and I want to welcome our guest today, Derek Fye. Derek is the author of this uh, wonderful book, We Were Born to Run. So Derek, what was it that uh, prompted you to write this book? Uh, for sure, the, the inspiration was from my coach uh, up at Dana College, Jay Birmingham. And uh, it started out as kind of a, a discussion about my experience at Dana. And then it kind of morphed into his experience uh, as a runner. He's kind of a journey runner. Um, he's been at the forefront of, of a lot of crazy, interesting runs. And it hasn't been written about, um, save for one of his, his runs. So I thought, you know, I probably should get this down. He doesn't like to talk about it. I don't care. I'm going to write about it. And then I got into some coaching tips and, and how to run, uh, how to be successful, kind of in, in running, but kind of in life. Um, and you are a coach. You've coached at uh, both Dana College and at, you're at Westside High School now? Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm the head uh, boys cross country coach, and then I do girls track uh, distance stuff. And uh, I was at Dana for a couple years as the head men's and women's cross country and then head distance track up there. So. Uh, that got into my blood a lot to do uh, with Birmingham and, uh, and what I experienced with him. So I've read this book over the last couple of days and one of the things I thought was interesting was uh, Jay Birmingham and the effect that he's had on your life. He was a coach at uh, Dana College before and he's also a very accomplished ultra marathon runner. So you're a, a former student of his and now a friend of his and what are some of the things that uh, he has taught you that you've applied to your life both as a runner and a coach and as a person as well? Uh, he definitely talked about and, and taught me how to be dedicated, uh, de determined, um, how to be successful in the classroom. He, he always, always got on top of us and said, hey, you need to, you need to be really good at this uh, because running is not going to pay the bills. And, uh, and so we kind of, we were hooked into, into the classroom, but when we would get out on the, on the course, he would always have something to say, something positive to say about us. And I really latched onto that. Everybody does, and that he's really he attracts anybody uh, with his positive attitude. Um, and I, th I think that's how our relationship is has really grown. Is anytime I get an email, and I'm always excited to see it. Oh, Coach Birmingham emailed me. I still call him Coach. He's you know I'm 10 years removed, and uh, I still call him Coach. And I'm I'm reading his emails, and his positive vibes are. It's just addicting uh, to be around. Yeah, so I was reading the book the other night. I was thinking to myself that this guy is absolutely crazy. Uh, yeah, he's <laughs> run across the country. What was it, 71 days? Is that right? It took him 71 days, 22 hours. And that was from um, Los Angeles to New York. Yes, uh, 2,964 miles. He was all alone, uh, no help. He'd ship uh, items 60 miles up the road, so he'd have them uh, ready for him. Then in, New York, then in New York City, he was almost done and he got lost. Is that mm -hmm. right? He had no idea where he was going. And it was kind of freaking him out. Um, and when he told me it uh, originally in this past summer, I could almost still sense the anxiety 30 years later, um, not knowing where to go in, in New York, looking for the Verrazano Bridge. And he just happened to, to stumble upon a, a runner from New York who said, hey, what, what are you doing? And he said, I can't find this bridge. They've... <laughs> And there's police waiting for me, you know, and I need to get to, to City Hall to finish this run. And, and he was actually only a day ahead of the record, so there was kind of an, a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it was, uh, it's kind of a funny story of which he really doesn't tell anybody. Then there's the Badwater Ultra Marathon, and mm -hmm. this was amazing to me. It starts in Death Valley where the temperature can be uh, 130 degrees. It ends at the top of Mount Whitney, which is uh, the highest peak in the United States. And this was uh, something that he did by himself um, as a younger person. Then he went back to race the official Badwater Marathon or Ultra Marathon, which um, you got to help him out with on two years. So, what was it like running Death Valley, uh, 120 degrees, and you're just out there in the hot sun? Uh, it was it was hotter than hell. <laughs> I mean, literally, uh, literally, uh, I I can't imagine hell being much warmer than that. Now, the, one of the enchanting things I thought about this was that he was running, and you were on his crew, and uh, you ended up getting some medical help. Absolutely. It was 132 degrees. The hottest it's ever been in the United States is 134. So we were right at the hottest point in the history of the United States, and I was shuttling back and forth trying to give him water. And in the meantime, I was feeling the effects of the heat, and uh, 
started feeling woozy, put my head out the window, and that doesn't help because you're going 30 miles an hour into 132 degrees. It was like a, a blow dryer constantly at the highest level, uh, constantly spewing heat at you. So, yeah, I, uh, I ended up not giving myself enough water and drinking too much pop and not replenishing with water and, and got super sick. And you actually ran part of it with him as a pacer. Mm -hmm. um, 20, I did about 25 miles uh, walk jogging. Ultra marathon is not real running uh, per se the whole time. There's a, a mixture of walking and jogging, and that was, it was a great experience to be with, uh, you know, the coach that had helped me so much, and, and for me to, to be able to lend him a hand, it was a role reversal, which I really, really enjoyed. And then a number of you uh, who are with him from your former team uh, got to cross the finish line with him. What was that like? Uh, about half a mile to go in the race. You know, we've been on the road for 40, well, 52 hours. Uh, everybody gets out and you, you kind of do a group jog, well, walk, jog. And at that point, he actually, he hadn't ran, he hadn't jogged for probably 15 hours. It was a constant walk. And we all got together as a group. These are all runners that I ran with at Dana and, and all runners that he coached. And we all started picking up into almost, not a sprint, but a pretty good run. And uh, it, was, it was a great feeling to cross the finish line with, uh, with our coach. <laughs> and I've heard uh, stories about the pavement being so hot that the runners actually have to run on the white line or their shoes will melt. Uh, Birmingham that year stayed mostly on the gravel. It was just was unbearable. You couldn't be on, even the white line was going to be trouble. So you stay on the gravel, and that was bad enough. But uh, absolutely, it was probably 200 degrees. So the, the temperature table. swing had to be huge because when you got close to Mount Whitney, um, it had to be cooler temperatures up there. We were wearing long sleeves, uh, jackets. Uh, and and it, the race stops now. It used to go to the summit, to the, the actual peak. Yeah. And the first time he did it in 1981, mm -hmm. they got caught in a severe uh, snowstorm. So you go from 130 degrees to it was probably 10 at the top of Mount Whitney. So yeah, it, you have to be prepared for the extremes, in, even along the course. You're talking about changing clothes because uh, it goes up 4,000 feet. You've got to be prepared. So you are an accomplished runner as well. You were a two-time All-American at Dana College, and you're also a, a marathon runner now. You've had a few injuries in your career, I know. Um, a couple years ago, you ran the Boston Marathon in 2009, it was, and you finished 77th out of uh, 25,000 runners, so that's quite an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Um, how have you overcome injuries and adversity as a runner? And you know that was really an incredible perform performance that you had at Boston that year. And like, uh, what principles do you put into your practice in your life to overcome adversity? Just got to have a a positive attitude. Um, that's the number one thing that I've learned from Birmingham. That I've taken hopefully to my runners. That you have to think positively. It's going to get better. Uh, take some time off the world's not going to end. You just have to have a positive attitude. And every time I run into a, you know, some sort of issue, some sort of injury, I just think, okay, you know what, we're going we're gonna to reset. Tomorrow's another day. Give it another go. Didn't work. The day after tomorrow's going to be another day. And if you keep on approaching it that way, that sometime you're going to be better. You're going to be fine. Because I want to talk about your coaching for a little bit. You were a college cross-country coach and now you work with uh, high school students and I know you also work with adult uh, marathon runners. And what, um, <clears throat> what principles do you encourage uh, runners to accomplish uh, their goals? Like how do you go through the goal setting process and help people with that? They need to be very realistic, um, be smart with their training and their planning. Uh, a couple of high school runners that I've had if, if wanted to be that state champion, that 15, 30, 5K runner, and they're running 17, 15, 17, 30s. Well, it's not realistic to, that next race, I'm going to run 15, 30. No, you can't do that. And if you go in with that mindset, you're going to be disappointed. So you know what? Run 17, 15, run 17 flat. Take the 15, 20 second approach mm -hmm. and uh, take it that way. And, and do realize as a runner, running takes time. It takes patience. And that might be the the number one factor to a successful and a non-successful runner is, do you have the patience to, to just wait? Okay, if I just keep training, if I run every day, if I listen to my coach, if I'm smart, if I set very realistic goals, what am I going to look like in four years? Um, and you'll be surprised. One of, one of the things is we both share a lifelong passion and a commitment to running. 
And I, w I was just thinking of all the uh, different lessons that I've learned from running, and I'd be interested to hear some of the life lessons that you've learned from uh, being a runner and a coach for almost 20 years now. Uh, teamwork. Um, I've learned so much from working uh, together. Running has brought me with more people than I ever thought, and 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 people that I I find that I hold an accountability to. Um, and uh, patience. Patience is such a big, a big step for runners, and, and I learned that young. You know, I got lapped twice in my first varsity meet. That's horrible. But I knew, you know, if I just stick with it, that determination, that, uh, that will to succeed, um, if you can just be patient with that. Um, I've learned that if you're, if you're very positive, if you're motivated, you can really do anything you want to. I would have never thought, oh, I'm going to finish in the top six in the country in, in the NAI in, in track, in the marathon. I'm going to run a marathon when I'm 18. I really didn't think about that um, until Birmingham said, hey, you can do this. So I think I've learned that the more people you surround uh, yourself with that are, that are positive, that, that care about you, um, that have a vested interest in you, I think the better. And so that's the approach that I take with, uh, with my runners. You know, I want them to, th to know that you know, I can go to, to Coach Phi with anything and, and, uh, and talk to him, and he's going to care, and he's going to listen. He's not going to beat me up, uh, you know, not physically or literally, but when we're running, he's not going to make me uh, go out there and do crazy stuff. He knows what he's doing. Uh, so you have to have that, that connection. And I found through running that, that idea of teamwork is, is just huge. So Derek, how does one uh, purchase this book? Uh, just make a checkout for $17 uh, to me, Derek Fye, and you can send it to 7513 Wyoming Street. Uh, that's Omaha, Nebraska, 68122. Uh, we're not online just yet, um, but you can also stop up at the West Side Track uh, on any given day after school, uh, somewhere around 3.30 to 5.15, and I'll have books available there for $15 since I don't have to ship it. Wednesday, March 30th at 7 p.m. at Westside Middle School in the auditorium. I'll be given a book discussion and also I'll be signing books so you can purchase one at that event uh, if you're available. Well, Derek, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and it was also a pleasure to read your book. You've done an excellent job on this and I know that this will be a blessing to many people. Well, thank you very much and thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight on WeTV. Our guest next week will be Jill Ladd. She's a registered dietitian. And Jill will talk to us about uh, how to have an effective diet and also how our diet reflects our relationship with God. And I also invite you to join us on Sunday morning, March 27th at the Water's Edge. We meet at Millard West High School. We have worship services at 9 o'clock and 1030. On Sunday morning, we're going to continue our uh, sermon series as we look at the last words of Jesus. One of the last phrases that Jesus said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we get to come and we get to experience and uh, embrace the forgiveness that God gives us. So I hope to see you on Sunday morning. We'll see you next week on WeTV. This has been Pastor Craig Finistead. <laughs>